Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live session, which will aim to act as a broad introduction to the topic of urban complexity. Um, so to start with some context around this growing field, as we can see, uh, modern times have been, uh, sorry, I'm just receiving a bit of feedback, so I'm just going to... Uh, Sorry, there we go, just receiving a bit of feedback. So, um, but yeah, so for some uh, context, so as we can see, modern times have been characterized by a dramatic rise in the rate of urbanization with more than 50% of the world's population living in cities. Um, and although this has led to an increase in productivity and boosted the global economy, it brings with it many challenges such as overcrowding, pollution, and potentially accelerating the spread of disease. And the field of urban complexity explores the dynamics of cities as complex systems through the application of various methodologies and modeling techniques, which provide for the potential of designing smarter, more resilient and sustainable cities. And so in this webinar, we'll seek to introduce the concept of urban complexity to those who are new to the field and discuss some of its characteristics and look at various studies and consider the future direction of this field. Um, and so joining us today to, dis to discuss this topic, we're very grateful to have Scott Dempwolf, who is an assistant research professor in the Urban Studies and Planning Program at the University of Maryland, and director of the university's Morgan State Center for Economic Development. His research examines relationships between innovation, manufacturing, and economic development in global and regional contexts. Scott has practiced community and economic development for over 20 years at the neighborhood, city, county, and regional levels before returning to academia. And Scott has also earned his PhD in urban and regional planning at the University of Maryland, a master's in community and regional planning at Temple University, and a bachelor's from MIT. Uh, and so joining Scott today, we have myself and Cobus Van Royen as co-hosts. Cobus is also a partner uh, with Systems Innovation and focuses on urban complexity, having over 20 years experience in geographic information systems and urban planning, as well as being a PhD researcher on the subject at the University of London. And so the session today will be more of an interview format um, and we will leave about you know, 10, 15 minutes at the end, maybe potentially more, um, for audience questions. So as you're listening to us, if there's anything that kind of stands out or you kind of, um, you know, you want to ask more about, then absolutely we'll we should have time at the end for, for plenty of questions. Um, and so on that note, I'll now pass on to Cobus, uh, who will lead us on to our first question. Thank you very much, Bowen. Um, good afternoon, Scott. Um, welcome to our very first webinar on urban complexity. So as some of our attendees to this webinar may not be familiar with the concepts of urban complexity or complexity science even, um, I thought it good to maybe just give a quick definition of both. So basically complexity science is really the study of systems that are complex in the sense that they are um, compiled of many different components, smaller components interacting with each other in a nonlinear manner. And then also um, manifest, you know, signs of emergence and adaptation over time. Um, saying that consequently urban complexity then is, um, you know, the approach to cities as complex systems. So we look at social systems, ecological systems um, in the urban environment. And um, I think urban complexity as a study really allows us um, to, to formulate a new understanding of cities, how they evolve and also um, how they how they change over time and function, and it really provides us with a with a bottom up approach. I think of of studying urban systems, and really for us to potentially formulate better planning processes. So, uh, going on from that, Scott, um, from your field of expertise, would you please give us your viewpoint on the concept of urban complexity, and also tell us a bit more about your your work, your research, your teaching on the subject. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for having me on today. That, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I teach, I've been at Maryland since uh, 2007 working on, uh, I was working on my PhD and then um, uh, they hired me and kept me on. So um, 
and I've been teaching economic development. And uh, for the past three years, I've been teaching a course in smart cities and urban data analytics, which is um, very much in line with the with the idea of urban complexity. And um, and I actually uh, became familiar with uh, with systems innovation uh, with your organization um, uh, several years ago when I was putting the course together for uh, smart cities and started using the, uh, one of the video courses on um, uh, uh, systems, complex system design. Um, so that is the, uh, something that I have all my students uh, go through that course, uh, that video course uh, online as part of our uh, uh, background reading. Um, <clears throat> My work has uh, in innovation and um, uh, modeling innovation systems and innovation ecosystems um, really got me into the into the realm of complexity um, because we you know we didn't really have any good measures for for innovation and we still don't actually um, and. Uh, and that search for, you know, how do you model these things? How do you, um, how do these complex systems actually work? Um, you know, it uh, it's kind of a rabbit hole <laughs> in in some ways, but um, uh, but it it, it, um, it it took me into the realm that systems innovation is is focused on, and um, and so when I put this course together for uh, smart cities it really became very clear that the same principles that I was uh, discovering in terms of innovation and, and economic development really apply to cities as a whole. There, um, you've got many different systems layered on top of each other. You've got all kinds of, of physical systems. You've got uh, uh, transportation and utilities and, you know, Telephone and sewer systems and water systems and and streets and um, you know buildings and all of these physical systems, and then you layer on top of that um, many different social systems, um, many different networks of of people and organizations and uh, companies and institutions and so forth and and uh, and you know all of those together interacting all the time um, and and it's not just that, that every individual every um, agent in this in this complex system whether that agent is a person or a company or a, uh, an institution or a government um, is both you know doing their daily their daily living their daily uh, work and so forth but they're also adapting to real and perceived uh, opportunities and threats. And, um, and that makes it uh, very difficult, even impossible to, to try and model that with typical um, uh, tools that are based on mechanical systems and mechanical reasoning. Um, these systems uh, change very differently um, over time and we need different tools uh, and different ways of modeling them um, that are based in complexity. So uh, I'll leave it there and, and see where you want to take it. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I found it very kind of interesting how you, you introduced the complexity, you know, that, 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 you, that you experience when you're kind of perceiving the city because as you say there are so many systems on top of systems and that this complexity requires maybe a different approach to to kind of navigating and working with it um, and so one thing I'm, I'm quite curious about is how would you say that the study of urban complexity kind of complements or uh, or differs maybe in some ways to kind of more traditional approaches to urban complexity uh, sorry urban planning and design uh, good question um... So a lot of urban planning uh, 
uh, particularly in, in on the academic side, um, is based in in kind of traditional social science uh, methods and uh, and approaches, and um, uh, and to some extent physical science uh, as well. But um, and those are really based on the the um, uh, the old mechanical uh, or engineering models of, of of how we do this kind of analysis. So they're linear. Um, they are reductionist, um, and you know. So we'll do you know almost every study has a regression analysis, and and um, you know, and you get through that, and you come up with an answer that says you know our our uh, our study of this particular problem uh, explains 47% of the, you know, of the variance. And, you know, that there's something un inherently unsatisfying about, about that, at least to me, um, uh, that we're not able to model something in a way that, that gives us, uh, you know, much greater, um, confident in the in the answers that we're getting um, and so you know i i don't want to detract from the um, uh, more traditional uh, approaches i you know i think they um, uh, they have been useful especially when things moved much slower and and um, you know and we had time to to think about things and, and adapt to to a changing world, but um, uh, you know the world's moving much faster now, and uh, it um, uh, those approaches are are more are breaking down more frequently, um, and so I think we need new approaches based on um, uh, complexity, based on uh, modeling cities as ecosystems. Um, or complex systems, and uh, uh, and then developing new methods and metrics along with that. Uh, but first, it takes the the it takes a mental shift to move from the from the old way of doing things to a new way, and that's very tough. That's that's actually the hardest part of the of um, of the whole process is deciding to make that change. Yeah, no, I think it's a very good, um, very good, good point you're making. Um, I mean, if we if we really think about urban studies, so cities have been around for thousands of years, but effectively urban studies are about 100 years old. You're looking at yeah. Geddes, is it 1915? Yeah. So effectively, the, the complex approach to cities is obviously even newer. And um, you mentioned the reductionist approach to, to urban studies and um, you know the, the kind of top-down approach and and I think it's still very relevant as you mentioned especially looking at master planning um, urban design but also understanding how that can be combined with the bottom-up approach really to understand the complex nature of cities and um, underlying cities and urban systems yes um... And you know, if you look at if you look back at, at uh, you know some of the uh, some some early authors that were were focused on um, understanding yeah. urban systems in in more complex ways. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take it back to to Raymond Unwin, uh, 1909, in Town Planning and Practice. Um, you know, it was a great book, um, and uh, it got lost for uh, for decades. Um, but in the in the 1980s, some uh, some folks uh, discovered it. Uh, Andres Guani, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, and that book became the foundation for um, for their work and for what we now refer to pretty commonly as new urbanism. Um, it, it's a book that that focuses on uh, on the patterns of of design, patterns of development as they relate to how people use cities. Um, 
Another one is uh, Christopher Alexander's uh, A Pattern Language, which in uh, planning and architecture circles has been kind of on the fringe for uh, since 1977, since he published it. And, um, you know, but that really looks at design of, uh, of buildings, of cities and, and so forth um, as patterns uh, built around the way people use space. And, you know, it reminds me a great deal of the, um, of the iceberg uh, image of complexity and you know, I'll let one of you guys talk about that, but um, where, where uh, you know, you have your visible part and right below the, the surface is um, a, a patterns layer where we recognize patterns and then it, and then it goes deeper and deeper uh, from that. So, um, you know, but it, it's a way to look at um, urban systems in, in uh, more complex ways in, as patterns. So there's parts of it that, that we see, that we recognize um, as just being part of that, that overall system. Um, so those are, those are two. There, there are a few more that I wanna talk about uh, as we go along, but uh, that's two, I'll let you go from there. Yeah, one thing that um, I found very interesting is how you kind of emphasize this idea of, you know, spotting these patterns, but recognizing that, you know, like the iceberg model, there's, there's lots that kind of lead to what we might see. Um, I'm curious how, um, from your perspective, the, the field of urban complexity helps you see these patterns? And, and do you have any examples of, of you know, patterns that, that that you know, viewing things from a complexity view has, has helped to see, and yeah, and, and the how um, of how it was approached using the these mindset. Uh, good question. Um, you know, so one of the interesting things, uh, uh, Anthony Townsend's book, um, uh, Smart Cities, uh, another uh, another one of the texts that I use in my Smart Cities course. Um, and he has a, actually a, a great um, passage in there where, you know, where he talks about Christopher Alexander and, um, uh, and the fact that Alexander has been on, on the fringe in, in planning and, and architecture for a long time, but, um, you know, has uh, had a great influence on um, computer programming. Um, that the, his ideas really kind of form the, the, the basis for object-oriented programming um, and kind of re reusable modules, um, uh, which I think is a, is a great story because then, you know, when you, um, you know, when you're looking at the, at the apps on your phone that, um, uh, uh, you know, that are, are maps or, or Yelp or, you know, any of those, and you realize that the, um, you know, that the same guy had the precursors to that, to the programming that you're using on your phone, also understood the patterns of the city that you're looking at. Um, you know, that uh, Townsend talks about the, you know, the, uh, you know, that 50 year gap just closing in, in an instant, um, you know, and I've had uh, similar experiences. Um, But yeah, I mean, you, you, I guess I, I, you know, I've made this the transition. Um, I made the transition of several years ago to this, this kind of complexity approach. So, a lot of times I don't, um, I, I see patterns and I don't, you know, I don't even give it a second thought. Um, uh, it, it does take some. Uh, some training, but I, I think um, one of the things that I notice is that is the way that people adapt um, and how that how that changes in how the changes things in fairly predictable 
ways once you start to see the patterns. Um, but it may seem very chaotic um, uh, if you're if you're not looking for the patterns. If you're just looking at the at the symptoms, it can seem very chaotic. Um, but uh, you know, if you if you have that mental model that in which the, the patterns are grounded, um, it's much easier to see. Yeah, I think um, it's actually interesting that you mention adaptation there as well. So I've read a, a very interesting article this week um, by, by City Lab. So they had this conversation with a professor from Melbourne about the, the spread of the coronavirus. And actually, yes. how, you know, the, the interesting points that came from that about um, how we rethink densification and the aspiration we have of it or for it, yeah. but also, you know, how we should really consider decentralization of services, for instance. Um, and then also from the bottom up approach, really, how digital technologies can help us to, to gather information about the health status of people, for instance. Um, and I think, um, I think one of the interesting um, facts or interesting things that I took away from that was actually that the spread of the coronavirus shows us once again that cities internationally are part of a global system, regardless of where they are, they're interconnected and they affect each other. Um, and yeah, I think we, we've moved past the debate of the global north and the global south, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, complexity is, is, is about systems of systems too, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, you know, if you're focused on at the level of the city, you're looking at all of the systems that, that make up that city. Um, and then you, you, you zoom out a little bit and those cities are just nodes in the, um, in a larger global system. And particularly, you know, with coronavirus, it's particularly about a, a, a transportation system, um, that is, is about, you know, moving people and moving goods and, and so forth. And um, you know, cities, um, Ed Glazer in his book, City, um, said that cities are, are mankind's um, oldest invention. Um, you know, it is, uh, cities are great for um, uh, sharing ideas and, and uh, collaborating. And they're great for um, for commerce, trade, and um, you know, for for exchange and and uh, all of those things, and all of those things that that you know the the ability to connect and interact with uh, uh, with a group of people, and then but also with new people. So you have your 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 close contacts, your your um, your clicks, as they're called in, in network analysis, but then you have the diversity. You're able to connect with, uh, with new people, with new ideas um, easily and, and, uh, and quickly and frequently. And that those characteristics that make it good for innovation and good for commerce also make cities vulnerable um, when you have threats like um, coronavirus or even, um, you know we're uh, you know we're dealing here in the US we're dealing with with disinformation campaigns and um, interference with our elections and so forth um, those things can happen because of for the very reasons that we have um, benefits uh, to cities is that openness that um, that makes it vulnerable and so um, what we're starting to see uh, you know, how do we deal with this, uh, the spread of coronavirus and the pandemic is, you know, the, the latest ideas are about social isolation. So, um, and using technology that way. And so many universities, mine included, um, have uh, students who are about to go on spring break. Um, and they've said, you know what, don't come back after spring break. We're going to move all the, all the courses online um, after spring break uh, through at least uh, April 10th, I think is the, is the earliest date that we would consider coming back. Uh, some are, are through the rest of the 
semester. Um, but we're using technology, uh, you know, like Zoom meeting and, and YouTube and so forth that we're that we're on right now, um, and other technologies that uh, uh, universities have to um, to move our class meetings online. And you know, it, it's not the way that uh, many or even most of us academics are accustomed to doing this uh, this kind of thing, but we'll learn. Um, and actually, you know, I, 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 I've been reading on Twitter and so forth that, uh, uh, you know, people are concerned about the, the, the quality of the, of the instruction that, um, you know, that students will get in the next several weeks as, as we go online. And yeah, um, it, it will probably suffer um, uh, somewhat. But you know what? There's a lot of people that are going to learn out of this experience um, more than just the, the, the substance things that we're teaching. And it'll drive uh, innovation in ed tech over the next several years, I'm sure. So, um, so again, it, it's always a, it's always a double-edged sword. Um, you know, the, there are vulnerabilities and there are um, opportunities at the same time. Yeah, that's really good. And I think um, I've, I've read also that Cornell University would go online with their teaching from the 9th of April, I think. So there's really a lot of US universities really focusing on this now. And using the technologies, as you, as you mentioned, really also makes me think about how complexity is untangled, urban complexity with the application of new technologies. Um, I mean, to to, to mention a few, you know, that, that really give us new insights to, to urban systems is, is big data. And the, the, yes. the processing power we have nowadays to actually process data sets and understand them better and um, advanced, advancement in visualization as well. If you look at geospatial data sciences, GIS, yep. but also um, smart city technologies um, and urban simulation toolkits, um, you look at agent-based modeling, cellular automata. These are all toolkits that really help us to dynamically model and, and understand city systems better. Yes. Um, yeah, I would say you, um, in my modeling of, of innovation systems and my um, you know, perspective modeling of, of urban complexity, um, I think you you need to look at, at two things. You need to look at process, and you need to look at structure. Um, the the process, you know, any any process, and and I'll, I'll kind of um, divert back to the innovation side for a minute because it's it's what I'm I'm most comfortable with, but. Um, you know, so you think about an innovation process. You know, innovation is about taking um, discoveries and research um, and transforming that into a new product in the marketplace. Okay, that's a that's a fairly long process, and that process is made up of a, a sequence of, of discrete activities, um, you know, projects, if you will. Or as in the uh, in the analytic um, language, uh, we'll refer to them as events. Okay, um, and so you look at how these events, um, you know, what events occur, how they're connected. Um, they're connected by uh, knowledge flows and and uh, the same people and so forth. Um, and you have the same thing in in cities. And um, you know, people are are working on um, whatever projects they're working on. They're they're engaged in in life. They're, um, you know, they they'll go from one activity to the next uh, to the next. Um, and at the same time as they as they do that, um, they are um, activating certain parts of their network, okay, um, uh, to, to engage in this with them. 
So, um, you know, like this conversation we have right here, you know, the three of us are part of a, uh, of a larger network, but right now um, we're working on this, on this particular uh, event. Um, and, you know, if you, when you bring this idea of an adaptation back in, um, as we go from one event to the next, we have the opportunity to adapt, uh, to, to change things a little bit, to make the next event even better. Okay, so we'll, um, you know, the, the network will change, the, the, the people engaged um, uh, will change. The, um, you know, the location might change. The, um, you know, the focus of, of, of the activity, the technology, if you will, might, might change a little bit. And, um, and then the, the timing will change, you know, it's either longer or shorter. Um, you, you, you accelerate it, you do it sooner or you wait till, uh, till later. So we're adapting along these multiple dimensions all at the same time. And, and then you extend that out to everybody in all of the networks. And you think about that and, um, and it's pretty clear why our systems are so complex. So, um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question. But, um, yeah, th thank you for that. Um, and you, you talk about adaptation and um, I know that Cobus, as he was introducing complexity, one of the things he talks about is that there are often, you know, it, it characterizes this kind of self-organization, which is of course a very interesting kind of subject. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, how would you describe these concepts, you know, that are so vital in systems thinking um, of, you know, emergence and self-organization and how do you see this manifest in the study of urban complexity? And to, to mm. what extent do you do you see this manifesting in that? Mm -hmm. um, uh, good question. So uh, self-organization or, or uh, emergence um, are uh, qualities of, of um, complex systems, of, of complex networks. And, um, you know, as you said, this is the, this is the first um, uh, video series in the urban complexity um, uh, uh, field or topic that, um, uh, that you're focused on. And, you know, the question is whether this will um, uh, lead to, um, you know, one more, two more, a hundred more, um, you know, how will this, how will this emerge? And how does, how does this event that we have right here, right now, how will this shape the, um, the emergence of uh, urban complexity as a, as a focus or as a field at system dynamics and, and, uh, and beyond? So um, I'm sorry, systems innovation. Um, so um, and it, you know, this, That's not something that you can um, design in or control. You, you can't really control emergence. You can't control. You can't engineer it. You can't. Um, you know all of the. Uh, you can't necessarily control it. Um, you know if you if you understand it, you can. Um, you can get closer with predictions about, you know, about what might happen. Um, you know, but you you have to be open to to the adaptation and the changes that um, uh, that happen along the way. Um, I do know one thing that uh, Kobus, you mentioned big data, and if you think about the about big data, um, it is most often organized as event data. Um, uh, it, it's kind of an, an event. So the, the systems we use to analyze that are, are event-driven 
um, databases or, or uh, event-driven systems. Um, you know, and so it, what do you pull out of that big data? Well, you pull out, um, you know, information about how that event fits in a, in a larger sequence or larger uh, pattern or, or process. And you pull out information about the structure, you know, who's involved, uh, you know, where is it, um, uh, you know, all of these metadata kinds of things that you can that you can pull out about the the location and the structure of of uh, of that event um, in the context of all of the other events that you have you have data on. So, um, uh, so again, it's You know, we say big data a lot, but I don't think we really take the time to to think about or talk about what act what that actually means and what you know what it's data about what um, and how do we use it and how how do we think about it. Um, so uh, my two cents is think about it in terms of of events, processes, and structure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. That's that's really useful. Um, and I think you know when when we talk about self-organization and emergence in the in the urban environment, um, Portugali's book comes to mind: self-organization in the city, mm -hmm. which um, we will also share link on on YouTube with with all attendees. And I think it's it's really. Um, it's, I think that the core of systems innovation is really to, to close that gap between the ivory tower of complexity science and actually what we on the street know about complexity and understand about complexity. And I think if I, you know, off the top of my head, if you think about, um, you know, concepts of emergence or occurrences of emergence in the urban systems, um, you can think of physical systems like urban sprawl, uh, behavioral systems, travel patterns, transport patterns, social systems, um, yep. maybe yep. Uh, neighborhood segregation, for, for, for example. And um, also most interestingly, speaking of, of segregation or, or properties, um, e economic emergence, if you look at uh, really state values and how that fluctuates and changes over time, yep. how it adapts, adapts to certain circumstances. And, and I think especially uh, self-organization, um, if you look at slum development um, around cities and around urban change, I know that uh, Louis Bettencourt at the University of Chicago is doing amazing work on, on slum development um, internationally, mm -hmm. especially in Africa and looking at, you know, the, the, the complexity behind it and, and how these informal settlements, you know, develop, but that yes. there's still the underlying network of, um, of interaction between agents, you know, being people. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so it's really, yeah, it's, it's really great, great work with they, they're busy with at the moment. So I, th I think that, um, you know, so two of the things that, you know, the slum development and then also um, uh, urban sprawl or suburban sprawl. Um, there's an important point I would, I want to make about this, which is what happens when you apply mechanical thinking to a complex system. All right, because both of those are, um, and more so, more so suburban sprawl. But um, you know, both are driven to some extent by um, by policies, and so um, you know, in the case of suburban sprawl. Is driven by um, by zoning policies, and zoning policies that were developed in a in a fairly um, a simplistic manner that that um, you know are were designed to be you know kind of intellectually comprehensible, um, you know large lot you know separation of uses. Um, you know, it was all very rational, um, but but then once that that you know those zoning policies were out there, 
people adapted to that. They adapted to, okay, you know, what does this policy mean? What does it mean I can do with my land? Um, uh, you know, local governments adapted to it. What does it mean for uh, for tax revenue um, and, and so forth? And builders adapted to it. And and so um, you know, and then and then planners adapted to the to the way that um, you know landowners and land users were adapting to it. And so it it, it was a uh, you know, a, a rational yet mechanical approach to um, to how we use land. Um, the, you know, said that had ideas about engineering and, and control, like tra you know, traffic control um, uh, and so forth. Uh, in that, you know, but the um, you know, but the long-term outcome was was really kind of undesirable. Um, you know, and so we've we've seen a, a move back towards uh, you know more traditional city designs. You see ur new urbanism, and and you know, going back to to Raymond Island's book on you know the patterns of how you uh, lay out cities. So. Um, uh, You know, and I think you can you can uh, draw similar conclusions about the um, slum development um, in a re as a response to um, you know both planning policies and economic policies. Uh, you know that that uh, and in terms of modeling it and understanding these things. When you look at those types of outcomes um, as uh, kind of a, an aggregation or a collection of individual adaptations, all right, that people were, were changing and adapting and making the best decisions they could within the context of these of these policies and and uh, uh, perceived and actual opportunities and and uh, constraints and so forth. Um, when you when you begin to look at it that way, you say, okay, those are the adaptations. What were they adapting to? And so you can begin to kind of back into what are the what are the problems that we that we have that are causing people to adapt in ways that that we didn't expect and that we didn't want. Okay, because I don't think anybody goes into it saying. Well, I want to create slums, and I want all all the poor people to live over here. Um, you know, I don't think anybody goes into it with that objective. It's just an undesired outcome um, from policy failures. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think, um, I mean, if you look at slum development internationally, you know, it's it's also, you know. Um, a result of the, the rapid pace of urbanization. Um, and I think what, what's happening more, and I, I mentioned uh, the University of Chicago's work, what, what's happening more is that uh, policymakers and, and researchers are realizing that the, the informal side of the city is always gonna be there, mm -hmm. um, especially due to the, the rate of urbanization. And more and more studies are, are being developed around informal settlements, how they function, how they evolve over time, how they start off, uh, for instance, um, the segregation that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And um, what I find uh, fascinating and, and also really good is the fact that we now understand better that informal settlements are also actually systems, organized systems. Mm -hmm. There are communities in place it's for us geographically or spatially it might be a random occurrence looking at from an aerial point of view for instance it might be you know very random to us um but actually looking looking closer there are systems community systems in place economic yes. systems in place especially yes so i'm gonna um uh 
I know one of the things you asked me to do is, is identify some, uh, you know, some some key references and and so forth. So I I, I um, decided to stick more with the with some classics. So um, you know, 50 years ago, uh, Ian McCarg's um, design with nature was um, you know I think really a, a precursor to um, the creation of GIS and uh, and and some of the ideas that are are part of GIS. You know, including layers and so forth. So, it was a way to look at, um, you know, a particular environment um, as as a, as a sequence of layers to identify relationships that were not um, immediately obvious. Um, and you know, his particular focus had had to do more with, um, you know. Integrating our our uh, you know urban designs with with natural uh, ecosystems, but um, you know but you can you can extend that basic idea, and so that's another another one of the classics that um, uh, I want to throw out there. And um, Kevin Lynch's uh, image of the city, which is about how people perceive um complex systems urban complex urban systems how do people perceive urban complexity um as they try to make their way around the city um you know that was kind of lynch's uh, uh thesis and and so um you know it's a very interesting study in in the, in the ways that people perceive the, how when they look at the city what kind of mental maps did they make? Um, and those, those could be, you know, they when they make those mental maps, they're assigning, uh, you know, value. Uh, how do one? How do I remember things? But two, how important is that thing to me? And um, uh, so um, that's another one of the one of the classics that uh, I'd recommend. Which is about recognizing patterns in the uh, complex in a complex urban environment. Brilliant, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, it's uh, you know, as as you were saying, what kind of image do you do you see when you're thinking about cities? From my perspective, when I I mean I'm based in London, I just think of the London Tube Map. <laughs> mm -hmm. Quite mm -hmm. quite iconic, but that's a big one for me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm aware we've got um, about 12, 12 minutes left. Uh, we have have some questions from um, you know the, the people who are watching us today, so I wanted to just bring that uh, to 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 the discussion. So, the first of the questions is, um, could you talk about um, any experiences that you might have had communicating urban complexity and related fields to public officials, um, so they can apply it to real life urban planning? Is is that an end? you know if there's any kind of thoughts on how to approach these types of interactions if it's something that's that's been relevant um sure i can um i can talk about that actually um i think planning professionals um are actually more receptive to uh to complexity Complexity ideas than academics are, um, in, in many respects. It, it, it's actually a, um, it's actually an easier discussion, I think, uh, many times with uh, with professionals and uh, than with academics because, um, you know, academics are are very ingrained in this in this kind of mechanistic reductionist uh, uh, way of, of analysis and, and way of, of approaching problems and complexity turns all that on its head um, and so you know I, I've said uh, very jokingly um, to uh, to some of my academic colleagues that you know everything you thought you knew is wrong um, you know, I, I don't believe that, but um, uh, you know, 
in many, not many, but in some instances, um, uh, that's what they perceive me saying. You know, when I when I start talking about um, having to look at complexity very differently, um, I've had, uh, and this is more on presenting the the innovation uh, models that I that I do, but I've had people get angry. Um, and I, I couldn't figure out why um, when I, you know, when I'd show them a, a large network of, uh, you know, the innovation economy in their, in their location. And it finally occurred to me that, you know, these are people who are supposed to have a handle on their innovation economy. And when I show them this, when I show them, it's actually much larger and much more complex than anybody, you know, ever thought it was. They're threatened, you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, that's not my intent. Um, I've actually stopped showing the large networks um, in my in my presentations, um, but um, I th I think one thing you have to be aware of is that um, anytime that you suggest to somebody that they need to think about things differently, that they need to approach things differently, that they need to analyze things differently. Um, that's not gonna be received um, especially well the first time around. Um, and so you've gotta be very careful about, about how you present those things. Um, I can tell you it's been a decade, decade long um, uh, lesson in, uh, in in sharing these things. Um, I will say that I think the Systems Innovation uh, video series is enormously helpful, um, and the you know the, the tweets that you do, you know where you take one little idea, because complexity is this whole com you know complex systems approach is a collection of smaller ideas and um, and so the videos you know, each video takes one particular idea and, and expands it in very simple um, in very simple terms but very effective um, and and you build up from that okay so I found it enormously helpful um, you know, with my students and um, in, in helping to explain uh, things to to people in the public realm. Well, yeah, thank you very much. We're always glad to hear, you know, when when our content's been useful. So, um, you know, that's that, that means a lot. Thank you. Um, and so now we have a question about uh, sustainability. Um, so this question is, what can you tell us about sustainability and resilience indicators indicators for cities? Uh, um, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I, uh, I'm not sure that I can answer it. Yeah, that's fine. If it's, well. if it's something I, I we, say, we can know, come one, back to it later, thing, it's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing on indicators, um, a lot of indicators we see these days are indexes which are really just, you know, where do you, where do you stand compared to, um, to some other city uh, in relation to a black box full of variables. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of indicators. Um, you know, I, I think we use them when we, uh, um, as an alternative to moving towards uh, a more complex understanding and complex analysis of of, uh, of the problems. So that's just kind of my basic uh, uh, perspective on on indicators. Okay, thank you. Uh, so another one. Um, this is um, so in the area era of natural disasters. How do we consider urban planning in this context? And 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 should we kind of review our way of of 
you know, city planning in the face of this, this uh, peace phenomenon? Uh, very, very good question. Um, uh, so actually, uh, one of the first papers that I uh, uh, published when I was working on my uh, dissertation um, was a, uh, a review of the uh, social network analysis, uh, uh, the uses of social network analysis and planning. And my co-author on that was a guy by the name of Ward Lyles, who's now a professor in Kansas, I think. Um, and his focus is on um, uh, disaster planning. Um, so in terms of disaster planning and resilience and recovery from disasters, um, you know, this idea of uh, both the physical, uh, uh, the physical nature or the physical systems in a city and the social um, networks that are layered on top of that. Um, and if you add into that, the, you know, communication networks and, and uh, social media networks and so forth. Um, the, the social part of that, the social network structure becomes much more um, important in terms of, of recovery from uh, and resilience to um, natural disasters. Uh, you know, because first off, everybody, you, you know, they want to be, they're concerned, is, you know, are you safe? Um, and, you know, do other people we need to rescue and all of those issues. Um, so I think in, from a planning perspective, um, you know, we, we need to pay more attention to, to planning those systems. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and how do we then integrate that into, into some of the other uh, system planning that we have? Um, there are some, there are, in smart cities, there are a number of uh, emerging smart city apps, um, you know, and, and so there's a, a local um, municipality, Seat Pleasant, Maryland, who has a, they have a, their, um, uh, their app that uh, you know focuses on emergency emergency preparedness and um, you know the social networks and checking on your neighbors and you know all of those types of things. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and so this question uh, is is whether you've had the opportunity to work or interact with any professional futurists um, on Fut how futurists. Yeah, futurists on how decisions today will affect cities and their systems in the future. So this is, I guess, a bit mm. about you know forecasting and uh, and how. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So I um, uh, the answer to that I think is is probably no, but I'm you know I, I um, there I think there are some people at the Santa Fe Institute that. Um, you know, are are focused on those things, and and uh, I know there are some people that have been trying to um, connect me with them. So, um, so the answer is no, but I'm open to it. Um, okay. Um, okay, then. Well, so uh, maybe a time for one more question. Then, um, so you talked about kind of the the social network analysis you did. So I'm not sure if this relates to that. Um, but how important would you say is the design of platforms for collaboration between different stakeholders in the city? And uh, do you have any successful examples of, of how this might have come about in the past? Yes, yeah, so the design of platforms is, um, is very important. And um, uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of examples um, uh, Anthony Townsend in his book talks about a, a number of them. There, there's one that comes to mind. Um, I'm going to blank on the name of it. It's based in Los Angeles. It is uh, it is a procurement uh, app. This is embarrassing on live. 
um, I'm going to have to follow up with you on the, yeah, on the name. No but they're, 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 yeah. In Los Angeles, they are um, uh, the way they approach their procurement. Um, there's a whole new platform about engaging more local uh, and engaging not just in procurement of uh, particular goods and services, but in, in the innovation of public goods and services. Um, uh, you know, so it, it's it's almost a way to get um, innovation and new ideas in in public procurement as a add-on service to um, you know to buying supplies, if you will, um, or 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 letting you know contracts for transportation engineering. Um, and I, I apologize for not remembering the name. I was just talking about it in my class on Monday and I... <laughs> it's not at all. Not at all. We have grilled you with, you know, with like a thousand questions. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's absolutely understandable. Um, but yeah, we, we are uh, just about um, out of time now. And, um, you know, thanks a lot for joining us today, Scott, for, for providing what was our first kind of uh, introduction to the field. Of uh, my pleasure. Policy. Um, you know, really, really appreciate that. Um, and of course, uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today and for those of you who asked questions as well. Um, hope it, hopefully it was a useful uh, introduction. Um, and, you know, as, as, as Cobus has mentioned, um, if you're interested in digging uh, further into this field in different areas or complexity in general, um, then uh, we have some suggested resources, which we've added into the video description of YouTube. Um, so, you know, do have a look at those if you're interested. And um, yeah, a, a big thank you to to, to Scott and, and Cobus as well for uh, for helping set this up. Uh, thank, thank you, you very thanks much. for hosting it. Thank you, Scott.